Good evening. It's always so hard to say good evening when I'm so used to saying good morning. Welcome to First Church. Good evening and welcome to First Church. Those of you who are here <clears throat> with us in the sanctuary and those of you who are with us virtually. This is an important evening in the life of our church, in the life of the universal church. It's a special time to set aside, to remember. One of the things that we like to do at this service, and for those of you at home, if you would be willing to take part as well, we have elements for communion. We have bread and we have cup. Uh, when you, and there is no set time in this service for communion. But if there is a time when you feel that it is the right time for you to come up, perhaps after a reading, perhaps uh, <clears throat> after scripture, at some time, God may move you to say, come up and take, partake of communion. There is bread here and there are cups. Take a, a piece of bread whenever you feel ready, then take a cup. And when you take the cup, and you partake of the grape juice, put the cup right back in the holder in, a, in an empty space. So anytime <clears throat> God moves each of us in different ways, please, anytime, commune, not only with yourself and God, but with the whole church community who is celebrating or mourning what has been happening this day at this hour. So again, welcome and thank you for being here. Bless the Lord, who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Now please respond with me for our call to worship. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into this world, and we loved darkness rather than light. God is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Everyone that does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, but all who do what is true come to the light. Come, let us worship in spirit and in truth. We begin with a song of reflection. What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? Most gracious God, look with mercy upon your family. Gathered here for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, given into sinful hands, and suffered death upon the cross. Strengthen our faith and forgive our betrayals. Betrayals. As we enter the way of his passion through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
now and forever. We wait with each other as those who inflict wounds on one another. Be merciful to us. As we join the crowds that mock others, be merciful to us. As those who put our trust in power, be merciful to us. As those who are greedy, be merciful to us. As those who put others on trial, be merciful to us. As we crucify your beloved children, be merciful to us. As we approve of oppression through our silence, be merciful to us. As those who are afraid to do your will, be merciful to us. Amen. The gospel that Jesus Christ came to bring is a gospel of God meeting us where we're at. God peering into our souls, peering into our lives, knowing us at our deepest level, knowing us better than anyone on this earth could know us. And yet God forgive us, God understands us, God understands that sometimes we don't feel like coming before him. Sometimes we feel like just staying hidden from his face. But the gospel reminds us that we are forgiven, that we are worthy, that we are worth dying for. May you know that you are truly forgiven by Christ. Amen. We begin our time of reflection when we are looking at the service of shadows. This is a service that we reflect on the readings of the Passion. We reflect on the stories that we all know so well, but we reflect on very specific things. This first reading is the shadow of the agony of spirit. It is from Matthew chapter 26, verses 30 to 46. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Though all become deserters because of you, I will never desert you. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little further, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake 
and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping, taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The story continues. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a, a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled which say it must happen this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. We continue with the account of the last night that Jesus was alive. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and elders had gathered. But Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, 
And going inside, he sat with the guards in order to see how this would end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said the same thing. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. Some slapped him, saying, Prophecy to us, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside the courtyard. A servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Je Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. When he went out to the porch, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man. At that moment, the cock crowed. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went away, and he hung himself.
The next reading is from Matthew 27, verses 6 through 23. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood till this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor asked again, said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Continuing in Matthew chapter 27. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him.
As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of, if he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. Shadow of Death, Matthew 27, 45 to 50. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last.
At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, this man truly was God's son. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Our last reading of The Suffering Servant is from the prophet Isaiah, 53rd chapter, written about 700 years before the birth of our Lord. Surely he has borne our infirmities, our sins, and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sin of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit 
in his mouth.
That was absolutely breathtaking, Larry. Thank you so much. Our meditation today is on Christ as on Christ being the Good Shepherd. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. In Luke 2, the story of Christ's birth, we reflected on Christmas Eve of how Christ was born around animals and laid in a manger, the place where these animals would feed. He was then visited, first by the animals investigating who had taken over their food bowl, and then by the shepherds in the field, and by the wise men from a faraway land, as recorded in Matthew chapter 2. From his birth, Jesus disrupted the lives of literal and figurative sheep. We tend to focus on Christ being the baby king on Christmas, but he was also the baby shepherd, guiding his flock to the source of true light and true hope and even true sustenance in the manger before he could even speak. As a boy, Jesus went to the temple with his family, but he stayed there a little too long. After his family had left with their caravan and Jesus was proudly entrusted to a good aunt, a good uncle, a good relative, by Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph finally, after, you know, a little bit of time, looked around and decided Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was missing. So they go back and they find Jesus in the temple lecturing. They find their little boy talking about interpretation of ancient texts and holding his own and even impressing the people who have studied these texts their whole lives. As an older man, he started his public ministry by going to get baptized by a man who was likened to Elijah. And then afterwards, he chose some to follow him. But the people that he chose were not the most educated or polished people of the day. He chose fishermen. He chose tax collectors. He chose people who hid knives in their cloaks, ready to kill a a local official when they saw him. Because you know what? This land is our land. This land is the land of the Hebrew people, and we're going to claim it back by whatever means necessary. So all these unsavory folks, Jesus chose as his closest followers. He went around teaching about the kingdom of God as if it wasn't some faraway place or thing, but was current, something that was in the present reality. He saw those who were sick, those who were crushed, those who were hurting, those who were even oppressed by evil and demonic powers, as well as those who were taken over by political powers, and they had no say. And he met their need with healing, liberation, inclusion when they felt excluded, and he gave them direction when they were lost. Over time, he had people who would consistently follow him besides the 12 disciples that we all know. And he had those who would follow him at least around those where he he was. But some would follow him across the sea. Some would hear he was going one place and said, well, let's go there too. They uprooted their lives to follow this Jesus. They heard of his healings. They heard of his feeding of the 4,000, the 5,000. They heard of all these things that Christ was doing, and they decided that they needed to follow him. There were even those who were not part of the normal crowd of people who would be accepted at the temple, those who would be said, no, 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 you, you can't, you can't go, come in here, the house of God. Your kind is not accepted. 
And yet, these people were in the crowd that were following Jesus, the crowd that were anxiously following him wherever he would go. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And this crowd, he taught, he fed, and he protected. Obviously, I've never been a shepherd before. In fact, the only sheep that I've ever met has been on farms or at petting zoos or at live nativity. And the extent of my interaction with the sheep is to feel how good their wool feels. We all know how that is. You see the sheep, you immediately want to touch the wool. So I've never been a shepherd. I've never been a nomadic shepherd, which nomadic shepherds would travel from place to place with their flock, seeking rest, seeking shelter, seeking food, seeking water. But I do know that these kinds of shepherds in the lands of Jesus... They traveled with their sheep, and they protected their flock from thieves as well as predators. Now, we can imagine that not only were the sheep the shepherd's livelihood, so a shepherd typically was the youngest son of a family. The older sons took care of the fields. The youngest son would get stuck with this flock, get stuck with the sheep and would be expected to protect the flock or else. That's how it was. It was rough. And it was this, these, this family's livelihood. But the sheep also probably functioned as animal companions to the shepherd on the long days searching for food, searching for water, and searching for rest. Now, because I don't have kids, my dog is often included in my sermons. So I'm going to talk about my dog. During the pandemic, my dog at times was the only companion that was around me 24-7. I petted her when she would get scared. She noticed when I would be stressed and would come and comfort me. And it was always nice knowing that I had a living thing to care for and that I had a living thing that would also kind of look after me a little bit. There have been many times when I walked my dog and I've had to lead her away from trouble. Maybe it's a, you know, another dog walking on the path. And that dog could be as nice and can be and could just be wanting to play with my dog. But my dog is saying, hey, father, that dog wants to kill you and uh, I'm going to kill it. Uh, and I say, no, I don't want a lawsuit, thanks. Um, so... There's been times where I've had to protect my dog and be willing to cause harm to myself if another dog would, be, would attack. If another dog was coming near my dog, I would step in front of my dog and address the dog that was approaching, putting myself in that dog's line of path. So while I've never been a shepherd, I know a little bit about what it means to protect an animal and to be willing to cause harm to yourself for the sake of that animal. A shepherd would also carry a rod and a staff. Now the rod was a weapon. The rod could have nails on it. And this rod had a very specific purpose. To beat anything that was trying to attack the flock. Could be thieves, could be lions, could be tigers, could be bears. Oh my! It was to protect the flock from whatever would harm the flock. And the staff often had a crook in it, and the crook was meant to go around the sheep's neck to pull it from trouble. Just as I'm walking my dog, and I pull the, and I pull the leash, and I guide her out of trouble. They had two specific purposes, and a shepherd sometimes didn't have both. Sometimes they had one rod or staff, that fulfilled both roles. But they also carried with them a sling that carried stones in them. And we all know that slings can do some mighty damage and can take down some mighty giants. Their, their staff and their rod were essential parts of them caring for their sheep and protecting them for their own good. You see, sheep much like my beagle, are not the most intelligent animals. 
and they can't possibly see all of what the shepherd sees. So sheep need a shepherd to guide and to protect them. In the terrain of the day, there were many snakes, some venomous snakes. There were large cats, like leopards, maybe some bears, and there also even used to be lions in the land of Jesus, now are extinct. There were also many people who were either too poor to eat, even though they had fields of grain to pick from, that the people were supposed to leave grain for the travelers and for the poor for them to pick, they still might have stolen because they were hungry. Or there were those who were more devious and said, you know what, if I steal one of his flock and one of his flock and one of her flock and his flock, then I'll have my own flock someday and I'll be pretty well off. And so the shepherd had to be prepared to face predators ranging from anything from a small gardener snake to an armed thief in order to protect their flock. And at times, this meant putting their life in the line in order to protect their flock from trouble. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. When Jesus was betrayed by his his friend, Judas, his friend that he had just washed his feet, his friend that he had just fed, his friend that he had just prayed over, when Jesus was betrayed by his friend, Judas, denied by his friend, Peter, the man who had said, I'll never deny you, Lord. I will always be with you to the point of death, and I will not deny you. He was betrayed by one, denied by another, and all the rest of them, all the other ten of his closest friends, scattered when he was arrested. Because when the shepherd is struck, the sheep scatter because they know that they no longer have someone to protect them, to guide them. And this caused Jesus great pain, fear, and anxiety. When Jesus was interrogated by the leaders of the temple, the rulers of the land, He could have denied who he was. I'm not that guy. You got the wrong guy. He could have named every single one of his followers, including those that are not named in the Bible, you know, as kind of a plea deal. But he didn't do so. Instead, he took the punishment they administered. Today on Good Friday, we reflect on Christ's crucifixion. He was condemned by the people who told his closest followers that they were not good enough, and he was sentenced to death by those who continually taxed his followers and made them hide in fear as they paraded the streets in full, in full armor, full weaponry, and all they had was a rod, a staff, and a sling. And so while we reflect many times on Christ's death on the cross, I want us to ask the question, why did Christ have to die? There are many answers to that question. And I think that there should be many answers. I don't think that one answer should or does satisfy that question. But I want us to view Christ going to the cross as a shepherd fighting someone or something seeking to harm his flock. Sin is like a cancer that infects our world with greed, with pride, with selfishness, with violence, with excluding others, with taking advantage of those who are less fortunate, of those who are below us, of those who we think we can get ahead of. Its grip is strong and relentless, and we think that we can escape it. We think, oh, we're not like them. But the moment that many of us get an ounce of power, an ounce of freedom, we betray that, and we follow after this sin that is infecting our lives. Christ came to defeat sin. Death was the ultimate end that all people had to face. And there was no hope after death until the day of the resurrection, where their bodies would literally come back to life from their bones. And there was no clear path that led to any hope past that. Their lives, there's no hope. Their death, No hope. They just wait in limbo until this day of the Lord when finally 
Finally, things would be made right. The religious leaders kept the wrong kind of people out of the house of God. However, there were clear examples of demonic power and presence within and around the people of the Holy Land. So there was always evil in the land. But the religious leaders wanted to keep the people out. But it wasn't the people to blame, but the evil that was around them. The cross was a torture device reserved for the worst of convicts under the rule of people who did not seem to care for how they died. We look at the cross and we think, okay, the, the, the blood must kill them through, through the wrists and through the ankles. But it's, and that's part of it, but it's actually suffocation. Struggling to breathe. Every breath causes you pain. And Christ took all of these enemies. He took sin. He took death. He took excluding others. He took demonic powers. He took political powers. He took the, the cross, the fear of suffering. And he took all of these enemies on because he wanted to protect his flock. A shepherd protecting his flock from a lion, a bear, a venomous snake, and a thief all at the same time. He took all of them on to show them a better way and to show them that at least to him they mattered and they were worth protecting. They were worth dying for. It didn't matter what the world had to say. It didn't matter what the temple leaders had to say. It didn't matter what the political leaders had to say. They were worth dying for. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I have and I will protect you from enemies, and I will guide you into the light of the kingdom of God, even when you are surrounded by darkness. You see, the message that many people believe about our God and our religion, our faith, is that it's all about heaven, that it's all about what happens after we die. But when Christ talked about the gospel, when Christ talked about the kingdom of God, it was all about the here and now. If we're not doing anything to work change amongst us, then we're doing nothing. If we're not following the footsteps of the great shepherd who would protect his flock at all costs, then we're not going far enough. The gospel of Jesus is a greater hope than that. From the moment of Christ's birth, he was a shepherd to people who were in the in crowd, those, those who were excluded but still accepted, and those who were wholly other to the powers that be. He was a shepherd to people who were already accepted by everybody else. He was a shepherd to people who were excluded from parties, excluded from gatherings, but you still let them stick, stick around. And he was a shepherd to those with leprosy, those that people wouldn't even touch, wouldn't even approach, wouldn't talk to. He was a shepherd to Gentiles, to Samaritans, those who were evil just because of who they were or, or what they believed in, or their race, their tribe. He was a shepherd to all. And his flock has and is continuing to grow across the world because the light of hope and peace is redemptive. When people are told that they are worthy, when everybody else says that they're unworthy, that's a powerful message. When people are told that their life has meaning, when they feel worthless, that's a powerful message. When people are told that our God will protect them no matter the cost, even to the point of death, and has done so already, that is a powerful message. The message of the cross is the message of a shepherd paying the ultimate price to protect his flock, and of a shepherd that is not abandoned after the death, but a shepherd that leaves behind a way to go, a shepherd that leaves behind a way to follow. And so as we all prepare for Easter Sunday, we make our pineapple filling, and we make our ham, and we make our casseroles, and you know we, we pour the apple cider, um, we do whatever we need to do. As we prepare for Easter Sunday, let us not forget this Good Friday. 
let us not forget what the cross means. Let us never stop asking, why did Christ have to die anyway? And let us never stop thinking about the fact that Christ is our great shepherd who paid the ultimate price to protect his flock and that we are called to follow in his footsteps, to carry the message of Christ, his light, his hope, his redemption to the world and everyone that we speak to. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for your your message of hope and redemption. Thank you for your light that you brought to this world. Thank you for being our great shepherd, someone who protects us, someone who guides us to what we need and guides us away from things that would do us harm. Lord, you paid the ultimate price at your crucifixion, at your death. May we never forget the message that you, do, that, that you did so for us. The world is full of messages of condemnation. The world is full of pastors and preachers saying that you're not good enough. But the message of the, cri- uh, of the cross is that it doesn't matter what you think of yourself because God sees, you, sees us as worth dying for. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for that message. Protect us as we go throughout this weekend. Give us good times with our family. Give us good times with those we love over Zoom, in person, on the phone. Give us wonderful times where we experience the warmth of family and may that warmth remind us of your love for us. And may we continue to look to you as our shepherd. Continue to sense the little nudges and the little directions to keep us away from evil and to guide us in the direction that you would have us to go. Lord, be with us and may we, may we reflect on your cross right now. Let us pray silently individually. Lord, be with us all. Amen. Something that I want to share before I go into this next hymn is a practical and easy way for all of you who are here and all of you who are listening online to really connect with God in a different way, possibly this year. You may have your own plans for doing so. You may have your own methods that work for you. But I just wanted to let you know that there are more days left of the year than there are chapters of the New Testament. And so if you read one chapter of the New Testament a day, you'll finish the entire thing by the end of the year. And I cannot tell you the richness of the wisdom that you will gain from doing that, and you can do so and ask questions to those around you. But if you don't currently have something that you're doing and you, you would like direction, reading that will definitely help you tap into the guidance of Christ as our shepherd.
Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Now rise. Go in peace. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on the cross, keep you and strengthen you this night and forevermore. May you know that death is not your end. Sin is not a death sentence, and evil has and will be overcome in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.